zombies and humans is like in full force right now. Humans versus zombies, whatever. It depends on who you're rooting for, right? Do we have any zombies in the room? Catch. Oh, okay. Well, you're dead now. I just found it up here when I walked up. All right. So don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Some of you are laughing. Some of you are uncomfortable. Um, you guys have probably heard that before. It's kind of maybe an older saying, but a lot of you have probably heard it either way. Um, and it's not exactly what we're going to be talking about, because we're not exactly going to be debating the merits of any of those things. Uh, but what we are going to be talking about is matters of opinion and, and what we do with those as Christians. Uh, things that are not very clear in the Bible, right? Maybe gray areas um, in the Bible. And so matters of opinion. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and turn in our Bibles. So you're going to be in Romans chapter 14. We're going to do the first half of this chapter, and it's verses, uh, chapter, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. And it's on the YouVersion app if any of you guys uh, want to jump onto that. Um, and so what this passage boils down, I just want to give a little bit of preface to this, is essentially a call to unity in matters of opinion. And now don't get me wrong, when I say unity in matters of opinion, I don't, re- I don't mean that we all have to believe the exact same thing on all of these these maybe gray areas in in the Christian life. Um, There was a sort of a a mantra um, that that was around in the beginning of the uh, the Reformation movement, which is kind of where the non-denominational Christian church came out of. Um, And and essentially kind of what they said was was unity in essentials and liberty in all else. And so that's kind of what we mean by by unity in matters of opinion. And so it's not that, that we all believe the same exact thing, but that there should be no division in the body of Christ over these matters of opinion. And so the trickiest part about this concept and this whole, this whole topic is, is when you know, we start having opinions on what is a matter of opinion or not, and then you have an opinion on my opinion of it being a matter of opinion, and that's when it gets crazy. So we're going to go through in, in the first point, we're gonna kinda, as we kind of lay the base, basis for this, um, this topic in Romans, um, we're going to go through a little bit and, uh, uh, and talk about some principles for what can be designated as a matter of opinion. And so um, before we jump in, I want to mention that, that Paul's full argument on this kind of topic is really all of chapter 14. Um, but this first half really, really speaks towards unity and matters of opinion. Um, and the second half, really, the only major way that it differs is, is that it, it, he kind of begs uh, uh, more mature Christians to lay down some of their liberties so that weaker Christians might not stumble. But essentially, they're, they're communicating um, the same thing, unity in matters of opinion. And so our passage tonight, verses 1 through 12, can be broken up into three um, kind of separate units. As uh, verses 1 through 4, Paul first calls um, for unity rather than division in matters of opinion, uh, saying, let us not judge our brothers in matters of opinion or despise our brothers in matters of opinion. Um, and then secondly, Paul kind of looks past um, to where where we probably still have some disagreements, and, and, and in verses 5 and 6, he, he pleads for a clear conscience on these matters of opinion, saying, each one should be fully convinced in your own mind. Um, and then in chapter, in, in, the, in the third uh, section, kind of, Paul brings the section kind of to a close by, by reminding the Roman church uh, that everything they do should be for the glory of God. And so we're going to jump into our first section here which is matters of opinion, verses 1 through 4. So verse 1 says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. So it's almost certain that this would have been a, a, uh, a division, or this, this issue would have been uh, because of the, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, and it was a very even mix in the Roman church, and we know that. And so it's very clear that this would have been um, the, the dividing line here. And so Paul uses two examples. The first one is, is the issue of eating meat. And then the second one that he uses in verse 5 is, is the issue of celebrating certain days or esteeming days higher than others. And so this first verse is important for as we lay the foundation of what Paul is talking about for two reasons. Um, firstly, Paul says, As for one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. And so the first thing we need to understand here is that spiritual maturity cannot be a prerequisite for fellowship among the body of Christ. Spiritual maturity cannot be a prerequisite for fellowship. 
And then secondarily, Paul says that we should not welcome them to disagree over matters of opinion. And so first off, we must be able to, as Christians, we must be able to make the distinction between a brother and sister in Christ who is maybe weaker in their faith versus a brother or sister in Christ who is obstinate and rebellious against God. Um, so Paul is not telling us that we should, should welcome obstinately rebellious people without correcting them. Um, this would go against many of his other teachings throughout uh, the rest of the epistles. Um, and the first one that specifically comes to mind for me is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul um, commands the Corinthian church to cast out the immoral brother. And this, this immoral brother was apparently sleeping with his stepmom, and he was proud of it. And so there was no repentance, there was no remorse, and he was continuing to do it. And so Paul said, cast him out from among you. And for the purpose, and he goes on to say, for the purpose that he might come to repentance and be restored back to the body of Christ. But it's important to make this distinction here as we see that Paul is talking about in this section matters of opinion. And so these are things that we should, that we should be able to glean when we're talking about matters of opinion. And so uh, in Paul's time, uh, the weaker brother or the, the, the weaker brother or sister in Christ may have uh, come from the Jewish camp. And, and as being converted to Christians, they may have uh, felt wrong uh, eating meat or, or breaking their, their eating codes or, or not celebrating some of the certain religious um, like celebrations or festivals or maybe not um, you know, following the, the keeping the Sabbath day holy as strictly as they had previously. And so they may have felt a, a lot of tension um, with this. And so that's kind of what, what Paul is, is coming in here with. Um, and it's, important, and it's important to remember here that Paul's talking about matters of opinion, and this is a key distinction to make, I think, as we, our culture, we live in a culture that is becoming more and more uh, non, non-judgmental and tolerant of, I guess if we're honest, just about everything that is anti-Christian. And so sometimes this kind of seeps into the church, and, and eventually sometimes we get to the point where we're afraid to say that something is wrong, even if it's clearly, you know, something that we see the Bible says is sinful. And so I want to make this distinction very clear before we move on. Paul is talking about matters of opinion. And so moving on to verse 2 and 3, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. So Paul brings up an example of eating different foods um, as an example of a matter of opinion, something that was probably very relevant to the church in Rome at this time. And with Christianity being born out of Judaism, uh, especially the early church, it kind of bore the burden of, of many converts coming out of, of legalism and coming out of a life of legalism. And so these are always, there are always these tensions between the Gentile believers who have never you know, lived their lives in this way and then the Jewish believers who had always lived their lives this way. And there was this, always this tension. And you can see that through the book of Acts and, and many of the epistles as Paul um, deals with this within the church. Moving on into verse 4, Paul says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So Paul uses kind of a servant-master illustration here in this verse to show that God is the judge of all. And so Paul is kind of communicating a general principle here to, to show that, that uh, we cannot pronounce judgment on our brothers and sisters in Christ over matters of opinion. As we see in verse 3, it says, Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. And so the the judgment and and despising uh, likely probably follows those who were abstaining, uh, thinking they were a little bit, you know, a little bit better than everybody else for not participating. And then those who were participating probably despising those who who, uh, who, who withheld, who abstained, who didn't eat the food, right? And so we, we can see that, and you guys have seen that in your own lives as you've come up, uh, you know, against uh, matters of opinion. You, you can see that even in your own mindset sometimes when you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's hard to not be a little bit self-righteous, right? And then if you're, if you're the one, you know, partaking in whatever this is in a matter of opinion and somebody else is abstaining, it's, it's very easy to be like, well, you know, you're just... You're just a little stuffy or you're just a little legalistic, right? We see that. And so that's what Paul is saying. Do not judge, pass judgment on your brother in matters of opinion. Do not despise the one on matters of opinion. Um, David Guzik, who's uh, a, a really good commentator, um, he writes some common commentaries on Blue Letter Bible that you guys can access. I think they're really good. Um, but he says in reference to this, he said, Paul isn't telling these Christians to erase their differences. 
He tells them to rise above them as Christian brothers and sisters. And, and, and I think that that's, that's, this, that's what we have to be striving for in, in these, these matters of opinion, right? And so the, the, the kind of the topic or the overall you know, thesis statement, if you will, of this passage is unity in matters of opinion. And so we can, when we come against these matters of opinion, we always need to be seeking unity. So rising above, not, not focusing on, on the little things that we disagree in, but focusing instead on, on the, the one thing, the most powerful thing, Christ's death, his sacrifice for us, the one thing that unites all of us, regardless of our cultural background or, or our upbringing or even our specific church raising, rising above these matters of opinion. Um, so I was going to tell a story. I, I had a missions class in college, um, and it was uh, intercultural missions, and uh, my professor was talking about how uh, culture can kind of expound the, the problems with like matters of opinion even more so, because uh, there's just so many more differences. And so he told us this story about um, a, a missionary who went to, uh, to Africa that he knew. And uh, the missionary had a lot of success, especially right in the beginning. And, and one of his supporting churches um, asked for him to send a picture, like with his new congregation. Um, and, and so many of the new congregants uh, were women. And in this specific place in Africa, um, the women wore long skirts all the way down to the ground, but they didn't wear shirts. And so he took a picture with them and he sent it in. And the church, I'm sure, very well-meaning, uh, shipped him very promptly a box of shirts with their name, First Christian Church, whatever, uh, for all of the, all of the people in, within this new congregation. Um, and so he handed them out. He said, okay, you know, maybe we'll, you know, we'll try to get another picture that they can display better or whatever. So he handed them out, and uh, they came back the next day, and, and the women had cut holes in the shirts. They were wearing them, but there were holes cut. And so... I bring the story up to say that, you know, these matters of opinion are, are sometimes pretty complicated, right? And then you start to get into some cultural differences, and it, it can get even more complicated. Or even just, you know, I grew up in this type of church, and I grew up in this type of church. And, and this, this upbringing that we have, it can be pretty complicated. And so Paul isn't telling us to take this lightly. Um, but it does, it brings us to beg the question, what constitutes as a matter of opinion, Right? That's kind of the basis that we should be looking at first. What constitutes as a matter of opinion? Because Paul says, as for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Okay, so what is an opinion? Because we all have lots of opinions, but some opinions are like based more in fact than others, right? So what's, what, what, is, what are the qualifications here? Um, and I put this in the YouVersion app if you guys wanted to, to look at that. Um, but one of the commentaries I've been using gave a couple uh, good principles that I thought uh, were very relevant to this. And so I, I, I grabbed the, the two that I thought were the best. And so firstly, matters of opinion apply to behavior or practice, not to matters of doctrine. So a matter of opinion is not whether Jesus is God or not. Jesus is God, and that is paramount to our faith. It's not a matter of opinion. But a matter of opinion is whether a Christian should sing hymns in church or contemporary praise and worship songs. That's a matter of opinion, right? We understand that. Um, secondly, for a matter to be disputable, there must be no clear or relevant scriptural commands. No clear or relevant scriptural commands. So a matter of opinion is not whether it is okay for a Christian to get drunk, because we know that drunkenness is condemned. But a matter of opinion would be whether a Christian should drink alcohol responsibly or not. That's a matter of opinion. And so as we kind of look at these matters of opinions and we, and, and, and we think of these different you know, differences that we have and these matters of opinions that we kind of get faced with on a daily basis, these gray areas in the Christian life, um, we have to have some application. And so I think that these, these principles here are very good for determining what is a matter of opinion, right? Um, but the application for this point, I think, is, is pretty simple. Um, the next time you're tempted to pass judgment on somebody who drinks, smokes, or dances, remember Paul's words, verse 3 and 4. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? And then the next time that you're ready to despise someone who refrains from drinking, smoking, or dancing, um, remember Paul's words, verse 3. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the service of another, on the servant of another? And so 
Please keep in mind here, I, I bring this up as an example, and these three specifically as an example, and I kind of use them, uh, don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, I kind of use that as, as an example lightheartedly, um, knowing that matters of opinion can be very tricky. They can be sticky issues, there can be a lot of involved, there can be a lot of different factors that may you know, bring you to it this time or maybe not this time, or, or maybe a lot of factors even involved for why you do it or why you don't do it. Um, and so I know that these can be compl complica complex issues, and so um, please don't take me as being either legalistic or licentious. Um, but I think the main point here is that over matters of opinion, we should not be in judgment of, of our brothers and sisters in Christ or despise our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, be but because of the complexity um, of these issues, it kind of leads us to our next point. And our next point is be fully convinced. And those are Paul's words, not mine, so it's an extra good point. In verse 5, it says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. So in this next section here, Paul um, shifts from the, the uh, eating uh, illustration to the esteeming higher one day over the other. Um, and so Paul uses the example of this esteemed day. And this would have been another point of conflict in the early church, um, especially those that had equal parts, Jews and Gentiles, like the Roman church. Um, and and it, again, as we talked about, it would have been something that the Gentiles never grew up celebrating these. So for, in their mind, why would they start? And the Jews grew up always celebrating these. So why should they stop? The Gentiles should be the ones to start and they should be the ones to stop. And so that's the complicated matter, right? Um, but one thing that is important, verse 6 says, The one who observes the day observes it in honor to the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So in all things, give thanks to God, right? Um, but along this line of being fully convinced, um, I, I want to bring up uh, this passage in 2 Timothy. It's 2 Timothy 2.15. Um, it's a very powerful passage as, as Paul is, is, is writing some of his very last words, as far as we know, um, to a much younger pastor, Timothy. And, and, he's, and, he's, and he's charging him and challenging him and encouraging him to continue on with his ministry. And, and this is one of the verses. He says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And so, my friends, whether it be doctrine or practice or matters of opinion, every Christian should be rightly handling the word of truth. Another way to say that, maybe, would be to say rightly interpreting Scripture. And so, we have to present ourselves to God as one approved, a worker not ashamed, rightly interpreting Scripture. And so, being fully convinced on matters of opinion might be kind of a little bit of a tough thing to do. That's going to take some work on our part, right? But we must be fully convinced because that's what Paul tells us to do. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind and then go on to do whatever it is or to not do whatever it is for the glory of the Lord. And so um, as kind of an example of this, it was, it was recently brought to my attention that um, a lot of the most or some of the most popular uh, worship bands right now um, kind of come out of of a, uh, a, a church denomination that has some very faulty teachings. And so I've been kind of wrestling in my mind with whether we should sing those songs or not. And it's kind of a tricky issue, and it, and it kind of goes back and forth because a lot of their songs um, don't have anything, you know, overtly bad in them, right? A lot of them contain very true elements of worship as far as, you know, considering, you know, the doctrine of worship and elements of true worship to God. Uh, but then some do not. And so I kind of wonder to myself, by us singing some of those songs, are we by any way endorsing uh, some, of, some of the teachings that, that these bands come out of, of the churches that they come out of? And so I've been kind of back and forth with this in my mind, but I bring it up as an example to show that whether one were to sing none of this group's songs, or whether one were to examine each song, study them carefully, find true elements of worship according to Scripture, and then only just sing those songs, I think doctrinally this is kind of where Paul's words come into play. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind and then do it for the glory of God. 
And now, don't get hung up on my example here, and, and really any of my examples here, um, but, but I thought that this was kind of cool, and this might be kind of a fun act, exercise anytime you come up against a matter of opinion, is to kind of switch around Paul's words here, not in like a really bad heretical way or anything, but insert what you're putting in there, or what, what you're wanting to do or not wanting to do instead of um, the, you know, the, cele- the eating or observing a day. And so follow with me in verse 6 if we were to kind of insert this issue into verse 6. One might say, To the one who sings the songs, sing them in honor of the Lord. And the one who abstains from singing the songs, abstain in honor to the Lord. Either way, give thanks to God. And so Paul is not communicating that matter, matters of opinion are trivial by any means. This is why he says each person should be fully convinced. And we also have to be fully convinced on these matters. These aren't things that we should just, uh, you know, when they come up and we're like, well, I don't know what to do, you could go either way. These aren't things that we should just, you know, throw off and say, well, it doesn't matter anyways. Paul says be fully convinced, decide in your own mind, and, and give glory to God whether you do it or whether you don't. I want to read 2 Timothy again. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And so again, I think our application should be simple for this point. Be fully convinced. Our application should be simple, though our decisions may not be and, and should not be. It's not, these aren't things that we should take lightly. Uh, but when confronted with an issue, first off, we have to determine whether it is in fact a matter of opinion. And so if there are no clear, relevant biblical teachings against or for this, this, this thing, um, I think we need to study our Bible. We need to consult other mature believers. We need to pray about the issue and study more, and be fully convinced in our own minds of where we stand on this issue, and then give thanks to God. Honor the Lord whether you participate or whether you abstain. And so this kind of brings us to our third point, which is end goal. End goal. So I want to encourage you guys to think about some of these matters of opinion, where maybe you've had some disagreements or with other Christians, or, or maybe, you've had, uh, maybe you've seen some churches split over some disagreements that, that may be ultimately more boiled down to matters of opinion than matters of doctrine or, uh, or morality. Um, and I want you to think of these things, and I want to ask you guys, what is your end goal? What is your end goal when, when confronted with another believer who disagrees with you? What is your end goal? Is it to pass judgment on your brother in Christ over matters that are non-essential? Is it to exercise your liberty to the nth degree just because, you know, nobody can tell me what to do and they tell you not to? It better not be because Paul reminds us starkly in this next section how we are supposed to live our lives and who we are supposed to live our lives to. Essentially, what our end goal should be. Verse 7 and 8. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So Paul very starkly reminds the church of Rome that no one's life, no one lives a life only to himself. Everyone's life life affects the rest of the body of Christ. And Paul elaborates on this thought in in kind of the next chapter, or the next section of chapter 14 a little bit more. But part of dying to self is a laying down of one's own independence, Right? If you had to boil down the Bible's message kind of to us and, and our, in relation to our actions, it's, it's never a, like, a exalt yourself. It's always a deny yourself, right? It's always a lay yourself down. Lay down your own pride. Lay down your own uh, selfish desires. Whatever it is, it's always a laying down of something. It's always a, a, a laying down our own life in place for, the, for Christ. <clears throat> And so just as the illustration of us being many members of, as part of one body would imply, uh, as, as Paul talks about in Corinthians, every one of our lives, what we do and our actions affect the rest of the body of Christ. And so that's something that we always have to remember here. Our actions affect other Christians. And so what is your end goal? Again, I ask you, is your end goal to promote your own self-righteousness in these matters of opinion? Is your end goal... To, to follow your own selfish desires in matters of opinion? Or is your end goal to live and to die for Christ? For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. 
That has to be our end goal. It has to be. Verse 9, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. And so Paul is kind of echoing back to Romans chapter 6, uh, where, where he talks about that, how we are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism. And he says that, that if we are united in a death like his, we will certainly be risen to a life like his. And so this is part of why Jesus died and came back to life, so that we could die with him and live a new life in him. And I believe Paul is very intentionally reminding the church of Rome of this fact, to bring them back to the realization that, that Christ did not die to set them free from a law that they, that they could never obtain righteousness through, just so that they could bicker among themselves over matters of non-essentials, over matters of opinion. What is your end goal? Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. So then each of us will give an account to himself, to God. So Paul quotes from Isaiah 45, 23 to show that we will all give an account for our actions before God. So I don't know if, you, if any of you guys have thought about that. There's not a ton of verses of the Bible that, that speak to this, but um, whether you're a Christian or not, all of us will actually have to give an account to God um, of our actions. Um, are our actions good or bad? Whether, whether you're saved or whether you're not, there, there's uh, quite a few Bible verses here and there that, that kind of lead us to that conclusion. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. And so what is your end goal? Is it to judge your brother? Is it to win an argument? Or is it to glorify God in unity? Glorify God in unity in matters of opinion. What is your end goal? So how many of you guys like Settlers of Catan? Okay, a lot of people. Uh, well, in Catan, those of you who know, sometimes you get cut off, right? And it's really frustrating. It's very frustrating when you get, when you get cut off. For those of you who don't know what Catan is, you kind of start in one place and you kind of build and you kind of expand throughout the rest of the map via roads. And so sometimes somebody like right before your turn can build roads to like cut off your road and then you can't go any further. And so you can't get to like all of these resources to continue your empire. And so so it's very frustrating. It's almost like sometimes a deal breaker for the game. Um, but when you get cut off, you kind of have two, two decisions at that point, right? And you guys know what I'm talking about. The first decision is, is kind of the, the one that I usually, that I usually end up taking. Um, and, and, and that's to spend the rest of the entire game making sure that Andy doesn't win. Or whoever <laughs> cut me off, of course. But... But that's, that's one decision. That's like the natural inclination. Like at first, you're just so full of rage. You're like, I'm, they're not going to win. They cut me off. They're not going to win. Um, but sometimes you cool down and you, and you go for option two, right? Where, where you kind of reformulate your game plan, right? You figure out what's your next best plan of attack. What's, your, what's the next best way that you can expand to still win this game, to still come out on top, right? In the same way, my friends, I think when we are confronted with matters of opinion, our end game can't be to win some petty little argument or battle with our fellow believers. You see, we might win the debate. We might exercise our freedom in spite of everybody else. But when we focus on these things, our end goal gets muddied. Our focus gets taken off of the ultimate goal. Not to be just the settler of Catan, but eternity with Christ in heaven. And unity in matters of opinion here on earth, as we represent Christ's love to the world. And so when we get focused on, on, these, on these little battles and these little arguments, our focus gets taken off of what truly matters. What is your end goal? Our main focus has to be for unity in matters of opinion, knowing and trusting that each and every one of us ultimately will give an account to God for our actions. Verse 12, so then each of us will give an account to him, of himself to God. And so in these matters of opinion, no matter how worked up you get or how, how right you might think you are or whatever it is, trust that God's going to handle it in the end and seek for unity over division, unity over judgment, unity over despising your brother or sister in Christ. What is your end goal? Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. What is your end goal? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. And we thank you for how applicable it is in our lives. God, I pray that, that as, we, as we go throughout the rest of our lives, that as we come into conflict over these, these matters of opinion, I pray that you would work in us and you would rightly show us when something is a matter of opinion and, and when it's not. And then you would help us to, to either not pass judgment or, or to not despise our brother or sister in Christ. Because, Lord, we, we don't want to pursue our own self-righteousness. We don't want to pursue our own selfish desires. We want to pursue living and dying for you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.